All right, we'll be beginning our class for today. Um, uh, the on-campus students have gone on a mission trip, so they would not be here to join us. Uh, but then, of course, we will have our Google Classroom students joining in. Uh, so um, uh, we'll get started. Um, you know, uh, if Nina is there, you know, yeah, you are here. Yes, uh, you know, if you could start with a word of prayer, uh, and then we can get into our class. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Gracious, loving Father, are you able to hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, gracious, loving Father, thank you for this day and for this time that you have given us, Lord, to come to your feet and to learn from your word. Thank you, Lord, for all that we have been learning in the classes that have gone by uh, about uh, the person of God himself and all the wonderful things that we are learning to grow in our relationship with you, to know you more. We commit today's class into your hands. Commit uh, Pastor Deepika and all our uh, other online students who will be joining soon. We pray that we will have a blessed time, learn from you, and grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so uh, we've covered a whole bunch of doctrines so far. And um, today, we will be looking at the doctrine of angels. Uh, so if you were to look in your notes, we would see that you know we've almost reached the end. Uh, so uh, doctrine of angels is what we are looking at today. Um, now, the Bible does not say much about angels. Uh, so we don't have uh, too much detail. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that the recording is on. In case I make any mistakes regarding the recording, you know, please, if you can keep an eye on what I'm doing and make sure that I do it all right. Uh, yes. So, yeah. Um, now, um, when it comes to uh, just general folklore and uh, the belief systems of the uh, different religions, there are all kinds of things said about spirit beings, about angels, and all of that. Uh, but uh, what scripture says is what we would have to accept as true. Um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, in uh, storybooks and uh, West, uh, movies from the West, uh, we have this um, vague idea you know, uh, presented that when a little child dies, the child turns into an angel and is kind of floating around. Um, they have this idea that uh, pe very good people who have died, uh, they turn into angels. I mean, uh, all this must have been picked up from some, you know, um, uh, from, 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 from some religions in the Middle, in, in, in the middle Ages, I suppose. And uh, then they were popularized later through, through uh, fairy tales and all of that. Uh, but the Bible never gets uh, human beings and um, angels mixed up ever. I mean, human beings will stay human beings. Uh, and so they would either go to heaven or hell. They don't turn into angels. I mean, in no way are um, angels and humans uh, connected. They are two separate types of uh, creations that God has made. And um, uh, so, you know, we need to get that very, very clear. Good people don't turn into angels. Little children who pass away do not turn into angels. They go into the presence of God and they enjoy his presence, but they do not turn into angels. Uh, so that's just um, some kind of uh, folklore uh, that got popularized over the, uh, you know, over the ages. Uh, so uh, let's look at what actually um, scripture says about uh, humans and about angels. Uh, once they are inhabiting, you know, heaven, once they are in the new Jerusalem. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we do not have the online on campus students, um, you know, reading out the verses, uh, if we could have, you know, three or four of you, you know, taking turns, uh, reading out the verses, it kind of helps. Uh, so uh, if someone could please read out Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 23, Hebrews chapter 12, 22 to 23, please. Hmm. 
but you have come to mount zion to the heavenly jerusalem the city of the living god it's 11 so I'm, i'm i'm reading the right oh, words yes. 12 right oh yes yeah yeah hebrews 12 22 and 23 please 23 you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven you have come to god the judge of all men to the spirits of righteous men made perfect so here when we look at this particular passage we see that in heaven and also in the new jerusalem which would be you know um, uh, coming we will have thousands upon thousands of angels and then it talks about the church of the firstborn which would be the believers and it goes on to describe them as spirits of the righteous uh, that have been made perfect so these are separate beings the angels are separate beings who um, you know uh, exist as angels and you have believers who have whose spirits have been made righteous and perfect they also inhabit this new jerusalem but they inhabit it inhabit it as um, you know uh, people who have now uh, become part of the church and who are now are now enjoying eternal life in christ so in no way do people become angels at any point of time okay so they are described as two separate uh, types of creations and um, what else can we look at um, um, ephesians 1 19 to 21 uh, yeah, you know, today there would be a lot of um, Bible verses simply because, uh, I mean, we just depend upon these verses to know a little bit about angels. Beyond that, we do not have much information. So, you know, um, uh, thank you, Nina, for reading. But then if others also could pitch in, you know, if we could have different people reading out different verses, uh, it just makes it easier. So uh, if someone could read out Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, please. I guess, uh, you know, the first year Google Classroom students are not very used to having their Bibles with them. But then, you know, if you could just want to, you know, one of you could just, a few of you could just quickly go and grab your Bibles and have your Bible with you. Uh, and, you know, that way then you can actually um, read out the verses. Uh, Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, please. Yeah. And his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. For above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Yes, here it's talking about the uh, position of these beings, uh, you know, uh, these angelic beings. And over here, it's talking about how Jesus Christ has been now seated at the right hand of uh, the Father. And he is far above all rule and authority and above every power and dominion. And the third uh, phrase that is used over there, you know, in different versions, you have different wording. But the third phrase basically is something like this. It says every title or every name uh, that is uh, every title that is declared, every name that is invoked here, it's talking about. Uh, humans who invoke certain names, you know, they call upon certain beings uh, and uh, and ask them to use their powers on behalf of humans. So basically, it's the spirits that are being talked about, you know, these angelic beings that are being talked about over here. So people People invoke their name, they call upon them rather than calling upon the creator God people choose they they call upon this uh, uh, you know in, in uh, paul is saying in ephesians jesus christ is seated far above all all uh, uh, rule and authority including all these names and titles that are invoked you know by humans he is seated above all of that and he will continue to remain superior to them supreme over them not only in the present age but also in the age to come you know is what is how it describes jesus so again 
saying that Jesus is some kind of a superior angel also would be a very false teaching. There is absolutely no connection. I mean, he is the creator and the angels are nothing but mere created beings. Okay, so uh, that's another thing to keep in mind. Uh, so another scripture which talks about his, um, his supremacy, uh, that would be Colossians 1, 16. If uh, someone could read out Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Yeah, it says over here, of course, the visible realm, you know, what we can see, what humans can see in the natural realm. Those have been created by by. Jesus Christ. Over here, when it says him, it's talking about Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the one who created everything that is seen by us in the natural realm. And what about the things that we are unable to see, the things which are there in the spiritual realm? Those two have been created through him and for him is how it describes it over here. So even these, uh, uh, these supernatural beings uh, have been created through him. And uh, if you notice, this is being written to the Colossian believers. Uh, and if you were to read all of Colossians, you would discover that they had some problem creeping in. You know, there were some people who were kind of promoting angel worship. You actually see that term mentioned in chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. And so uh, there were some people who seemed to be under the impression that these um, angelic beings are in some way very great and to be worshipped. And so over here, uh, you know, um, Paul is very clearly clarifying and saying, you know what, even these things that you think are so great, they too were created through him and for him. You see, even these uh, angels were created for God. They were meant to submit to him and only do his will. And so the fallen beings, the fallen spirits that chose to oppose um, Jesus, opposed, uh, you know, uh, uh, opposed the Godhead, uh, what they did uh, was not right because they were created for God and for his purposes. And uh, so we understand uh, that even um, uh, Satan, who became a fallen angel, when he was originally created, he was created through Jesus and he was actually created for Jesus to submit to his purposes, uh, you know, and to serve God. That was the original purpose. Maybe we could actually look at that, um, you know, uh, those verses which talk about that. Uh, that would be Ezekiel 28, 14 to 15. Uh, if someone could please read out Ezekiel 28, 14 to 15, please. Yeah. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till wickedness was found in you. So it is very clearly saying over here, uh, uh, from the day you were created. And so over here, even as this passage is talking about Satan, it says that he was created. He did not exist from the beginning. Uh, so he's just a mere created being. And what was he created for? It says in verse 14, it says that he was anointed as a guardian cherub. He was meant to guard the holy mount. It says that you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. So um, he was actually created uh, to be like a guardian to watch over the holy mount. Uh, to you know, uh, uphold it, uh, to to honor God who is ruling from it, and all of that. So that was what he was ordained for. So even he was created by Jesus for Jesus, because Jesus is the ruler, the supreme sovereign ruler over all created beings. Um, and uh, so when the angels rebelled, uh, it was a it was a very uh, deliberate, conscious rebellion against the one. Uh, you know, whom they were supposed to be serving, whom uh, for, for whom they had been created. So they, they chose to rebel against that. 
And that is why we are told in Colossians very clearly, you know, that we must not indulge in worshipping these uh, angels, whether the holy angels of God who did not rebel or the evil fallen angels. We are not supposed to worship any of them. Um, and uh, this is what Colossians 2.18 says about angel worship. Colossians 2.18. Let no one. Let no cheat. one. Is that it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go I, ahead. Yes. Yeah. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up uh, by his fleshly mind. Yeah, so here it talks about people who are boasting about the things that they have seen in the spiritual realm. OK, and um, uh, based on what they have seen, uh, they are thinking that now they are very full of knowledge. Their unspiritual mind does not even realize that what has come to them is evil. I mean, it's not even uh, uh, godly. So they don't even understand that. And they have started worshipping these things that they are seeing, that they are interacting with in the spiritual realm. And uh, so, in fact, they are criticizing these believers over here in the Colossian church. And they are saying, ah, you don't have any such visions. You're, you're not getting any such visitations. So you, know, um, you people are not uh, really um, the chosen ones of God. We, on the other hand, are being visited by angels, and they are giving us secret knowledge about things which uh, which are not you know not not uh, written in the scriptures. And so they were boasting about it. And so here Paul says, you know, um, don't let people who are worshiping angels and such things don't let them disqualify you and declare you as not belonging to God because you people are the true believers. And he goes on to say that these people are getting puffed up in their unspiritual minds because they don't really discern the truth. They have allowed themselves to be deceived and led away. And so it is so dangerous to uh, depend on just a vision or a message that you have received uh, in some supernatural manner. Uh, we would all immediately have to go back to scripture and see whether whatever we have being told in that vision is perfectly in line with scripture or not. Because if, if that is not the case, then there is a danger uh, that what has come to us is not from God, and rather it is just something evil. And so we are told very clearly not to worship angels, uh, not to uh, you know very naively accept um, messages that come to us you know, through these kind of supernatural means. Um, now let's look at two uh, you know passages where you have John I mean John was a highly respected leader um, he was basically uh, functioning out of Ephesus at, at that time you know uh, I mean long after all the other disciples had you know passed away uh, he continued living for a very long time and so he was um, one of the main leaders of the church. So from Ephesus, he would he was basically uh, you know looking after the mission operations in the, in that entire uh, Asia, uh, Asia Minor region and all of that. And uh, so maybe because of that, you know, God chooses him specifically to write to the churches. You know, to the seven churches, he says, you know, send these messages to the churches. So uh, uh, what does it say about him? Uh, let's just look at a couple of passages. We will maybe first look at Revelation 19, verses 9 and 10. Uh, if someone could read out for us Revelation 19, 9 and 10, please.
then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. OK, so it's the testimony of Jesus, which is the uh, you know uh, true prophecy from the spirit. So um, when when um, this angel is revealing the uh, the true words of God, you know he, uh, the angel is as a messenger who is conveying the true words of God. The words that are being spoken are so powerful and so amazing that John, I mean John, who would obviously know better than anyone else, he is unable to control himself and he just falls down at the feet of this being and tries to worship it and immediately this angel speaks and says don't do that i am just a fellow servant you know with you and with your brothers so uh i too have been created to serve jesus the same way all of you are serving jesus so all of us together are just servants of this jesus and so he says worship you know worship him worship god for um yeah uh, He's the one. Jesus is the one who who uh, has these the testimony, the true words, you know, of life which we need, and uh, so all worship must be directed towards Him. So even if we get any messages from angels, you know, they appear in our room and they deliver a powerful and beautiful message. We must remember that the words which they are carrying are just words from God. He is the one to be worshipped. This is just the messenger. And the messenger is not to be worshipped. Even, uh, even when a holy angel comes, we are not meant to worship that angel. We are only meant to receive that message which has been given to us. And um, the surprising thing is it happens twice. Again, in Revelation 22, 8 to 9, um, when uh, you know John is interacting with one of those angelic beings, uh, it says over there, uh, and when I had heard and seen them, I know that the things which uh, this uh, the visions which this angel was revealing, uh, he, he, he says, uh, when I had heard and seen these, you know, these visions, he says, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. And again, that angel says, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets. So the thing about having dreams and visions and all of these supernatural events happening to a believer, uh, the danger in that is that you can get um, misled. You may get attracted to the phenomena itself, you know, where, where you think, oh, wow, all these things are happening to me. I must be in some way superior to all the others. And um, in the process of having those wrong thoughts, you may also end up, you know, being drawn to these beings that are coming to you saying, oh, wow, how lovely it would be if I could have one more angelic visitation, if I could have them come into my room and make everything shine and you know all of that. So never allow your heart to go after the angelic beings. Never worship them. Never let your interest be drawn towards them. Let your focus remain on the Lord. And of course, one day when we see the Lord, we will discover that he's far more glorious than these angels. Angels are just created beings. On the other hand, he who is the creator is infinitely beyond anything, beyond anything that is just created. So at that time, we will realize that there is a very clear difference between him and angels. Right now, everything shiny and bright looks you know, very divine to us. Uh, but um, they are, it is good to understand and remember that even holy angels, even though they are good, uh, are not to be uh, worshipped. Um, so worship of angels, very clearly forbidden in scripture. In the same way, at the same time, blasphemy of angels, whether good or evil, you know, good angels and bad angels, um, blasphemy of angels is also forbidden. What exactly does that mean? Uh, let's look at uh, a couple of passages which talk about that. Um, if we could maybe first read, Second Peter chapter two verses ten to twelve. Second Peter two ten to twelve. 
This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like animals, they too will perish. All right, so um, we are not given much detail about what exactly was being done over here, uh, but the warning is very clear. It says, you know, even the holy angels don't do this, you know, don't don't uh, uh, participate in this kind of behavior. So we humans also should not be doing that. And almost the same wordings are again used in Jude, uh, Jude, you know, we, Jude has only one chapter. So in Jude uh, verses 8 to 10, almost the same thing is repeated. It talks about ungodly people who have polluted their own bodies. And it says, reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. So it's talking about these ungodly people who are rejecting authority and heaping abuse on celestial beings. And then it goes on to say, even uh, uh, Archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but just said, the Lord rebuke you. And then it goes on to say in uh, Jude 10, yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. And uh, so uh, the, almost the same thing is repeated in Second Peter and in Jude. And um, you know there are different um, theories about what exactly uh, these, uh, what, what kind of wrong behavior these people were indulging in. Uh, we, we just see that in both places, uh, in both passages, it says that they were despising authority, that they were being bold and arrogant, uh, and that they were heaping abuses on these celestial beings. And we get to know that these celestial beings are uh, ungodly. They are sinful because it talks about how the holy angels are bring, bringing judgment upon them. Uh, in Jude, we see that it is Ma Michael, uh, Michael the archangel, the, the good angel, who is, um, you know, disputing with the devil, the devil who is evil. So we do understand that the celestial beings that are being abused are evil beings. They are um, rebelling against God. These are not good uh, celestial beings. They are evil celestial beings. But the people are being told to be careful in how they um interact with them and uh, so uh, you know one assumption is that maybe these people you know who um were um, this you know this this these are basically a part of the church right ungodly people in the church who are using um who are mixing up godly uh, scriptural truths with other wrong teachings so um it looks like these people were trying to use their spiritual authority in all the wrong ways. Um, so rather than being careful, they were being bold and arrogant and misusing the godly authority given to them. It's because it says here they were despising authority. Jude says they were rejecting authority. God has created all of creation in a particular way with a certain order and we are supposed to respect that order. We can't go addressing whatever creature we want to in whatever way. No, uh, there is a way in which God has established things and we are meant to respect that. So uh, speaking in that context, maybe these people were misusing the spiritual authority that is granted to the true believers. True believers can take a stand against an evil being in the name of Jesus, if that evil being is doing something that goes against the plans and purposes of God. So you, we, we do not randomly go about you know, uh, uh, abusing the, uh, the, the, the demons and uh, having conversations with them and saying whatever comes into our head you know, against them. No, 
we do whatever we do we do it only in the name of jesus with his authority uh, and only with regard to the things which he has uh, given us authority for so we have to be very careful in the way we are using our spiritual authority uh, we cannot just simply randomly go uh, you know uh, interacting with these demonic beings however we wish because it says even archangel michael when he had to dispute with the devil it says did not himself dare to condemn him for slander but said the lord rebuke you okay so um, we do not know the uh, full details of what exactly those people were doing uh, what it is that peter was addressing and what it is that jude was addressing we do not have the details but at least we get this much warning that whatever we are doing must be done keeping in mind the authority that has been established by god so if god has given believers certain authority to be used in a particular way we only use it in the way that he has permitted and we do it um, um uh, in a way that honors him and his plans for his people and for the kingdom we don't go doing uh, we don't we don't go you know fighting demons in our own strength uh, using whatever um, you know method comes into our own heads no that would be dangerous we may not be abusing the celestial beings in the way these people did because we're not very sure what exactly that was but uh, we would be putting ourselves at risk okay so um, worship of angels most clearly forbidden um, unauthorized interaction with angels where you know you are doing uh, trying to declare your authority over them in the wrong manner that also is strictly forbidden and not to be indulged in so we have to be careful about these things and of course any wrong doctrines that these angels are trying to give us that also is of course very much uh, forbidden uh, maybe we can look at a couple of scriptures um, regarding the false doctrines which angels bring um, uh, if someone could read out second uh, corinthians 11 13 and 14 please second corinthians 11 13 and 14 For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not yes. surprising. Yeah. So it's here, it talk, it's talking basically about the false teachers. And it talks about how they are pretending to be messengers of light, you know, teachers of light. And so uh, here, um, you know, Paul is telling them when Satan himself sometimes comes to people as an angel of light, pretending to be bringing the truth, you need to be on the watch out for people who will also do the same thing. And so there are, there are those who pretend uh, uh, masquerade is more like a you know drama term where you where you put on a mask, you put on a costume, and you pretend to be somebody else. So you have Satan doing that, who who sometimes uh, pretends to be an angel of light, and so that is why it says in Galatians one eight, it says um, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So um, when we receive revelations about scripture in visions and dreams, we need to be very careful. Is that vision or is, is that message which has been conveyed in line with scripture or not? If it is something that is clashing with other aspects of scripture, then we have to uh, you know, accept that maybe this is, an, uh, that this is actually a demonic being that came to us masquerading as an angel of light but it has actually brought something to us which is contradicting scripture so it's good of course to be careful in all of these uh, things um, and then um, just moving on to uh, the hierarchical structure that we see um, you know the, the same way here on earth uh, we have hierarchical structures which help us to uh, do our administration better in the same way, even in the spiritual realm also, there seem to be different hierarchical structures and orders. Um, so 
uh, if we were to look at first peter 3 uh, maybe yeah okay uh, first peter 3 21 and 22 if someone could read out first peter 3 21 and 22 please And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of the clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. It seems to uh, refer to three categories of these um, spiritual beings. It talks about angels, it talks about authorities, and then it talks about powers. And all these three categories of beings are now in direct submission to the Lord Jesus. You know, even as he's sitting there at the right hand of God, uh, these different creatures are in submission to him. They take orders from him. Uh, they they go and fulfill whatever plans you know uh, he has uh, sent them on so they they do those things um, so uh, it it seems to be some kind of a hierarchical system where you probably have the angelic beings like the archangels probably coming you know at the top and then under them you would have other authorities which are functioning and below them you would have the powers which basically take uh, care of the uh, you know day to day running uh, uh, of things that need to be done here on the earth so uh, in the same way, in, in Satan's kingdom, you have a hierarchical structure. Even here in heaven also, there seems to be a kind of hierarchical structure uh, where you would obviously have the archangels right at the top. And then uh, uh, below that, you would have different levels of authority. Uh, so um, also, apart from these angels, uh, among the good creations that chose to you know hold on to the Lord, we have these other beings they are not angels because that's not the word used for them. Uh, you have a different, you have different words used for them, and uh, so you basically have something called cherubim, and the cherubim seem to be um, performing one particular kind of function. Um, so uh, maybe we could just look at one scripture, Genesis three twenty four, where you actually have a cherubim mentioned. Um, Ge Genesis three. 24, please. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so they say that maybe the cherubim are some kind of, um, you know, guards. Um, they are uh, these kind of warrior beings that will, you know, uh, protect and defend and keep and look after. Uh, because if you notice, you know, even earlier, I mean, when we were talking about Satan, he too was uh, created and ordained to be a guardian cherub. Um, which was the worst, seemed to have lost it. Uh, yeah, uh, where, where was that? Ezekiel 28, verse 14. So he too was actually created to be a guardian cherub. So uh, the impression that we get is that these cherubim were specifically created to serve as uh, guards, guardians. Uh, and uh, so they would be, they would probably be extra powerful uh, because they you know purposes of God. Uh, so those are, they are not angels. Angels are a separate kind of creation. Humans are a separate kind of creation. Humans, of course, are extra special because they are created in God's image. Um, then, of course, you have even the cherubim uh, who have who have been created to, be, to maybe guard different things. And then we have uh, the other term that we are familiar with, you know, the seraphim. And um, uh, maybe one example could be Isaiah 6 2. If someone could read out Isaiah 6 2.
above it stood seraphim each one had six had six wings uh, with two he covered his face with two he covered his feet and with two he flew so uh, these are um, beings that are literally there near the throne of god uh, so are they meant to be worshippers is that their special uh, purpose i mean we do not know because we don't have any details mentioned about them anywhere else uh, but it looks like these are probably creatures that were created specifically to be in god's immediate presence maybe that is the you know their role and purpose and then in ezekiel you know we have these popular creatures that are talked about we also have them mentioned in revelation as well um uh, so in ezekiel we have a more detailed description about them uh, maybe we can just look at uh, verses um ezekiel chapter 1 if we could just look at verse 5 and 6 that should do i suppose um yeah ezekiel 1 5 and 6 and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures in appearance their form was that of a man but each of them had four faces and four wings then okay. legs... so yeah, yeah yeah it goes on to give very detailed descriptions about what their legs looked like and what their uh, uh, you know how many eyes they had and all of that um uh so i mean it, it they seem to have be having a human form because that's what it says in appearance their form was human uh but then it talks about them having four faces but then in revelation chapter 4 verse 6 to 8 when they are described over there again the same term living creatures is used over there over there they seem to have only one face each Uh, so i'm not exactly sure how it works uh, but anyway so this is another category of creations so even though when I mean, we are talking about angels specifically it is good to know that angels are not the only kind of creation that we see in the supernatural realm we also see these other types of creations that god has made and each will be having its own function and purpose okay so uh, this is regarding some of the things that we see regarding the good beings and then of course there are the fallen ones so when we come to the you know kingdom of darkness which uh, satan established uh, you know after he he caused some of the other angels to rebel along with him so uh, in his kingdom of darkness also we seem to see a hierarchical system and um, that would be that is actually described to us in ephesians 6 12 uh, so yeah if we can just have someone read out ephesians 6 12 and look at uh, and look at the different levels of authority that are described over there efficient 612 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places uh so the first one i mean you know different uh, versions are in our english bibles different versions have got different terms uh but the in in, in the original you know in, in the greek uh, the word that is used for the first one whether it's called principalities or in an, in an in, 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 in niv it says rulers whatever the term may be in english the original term that is used over there is arkas you know that's basically arkas like an archives you know something old something ancient archaic archaic is again some the word is used for something that's very ancient so that so the word that is used for these um beings is the term arkas which literally means ancient ones so probably it's referring to the highest level of demonic powers you know the the ones which originally you know when god created them they are the ones who which held the highest level of power probably maybe that's the reason why the 
technical the greek word that is used to describe them is the word arkas which literally means ancient ones so they are probably at the highest level and then come the next one um, again different translations will use different words niv uses the word authorities to describe the second level and the greek word is basically exousia which basically means you know they are they have authority and it looks like this is delegated authority which has been given to them by those by the ancient ones the ancient ones which are right at the top they delegate some of their authority to the next level of beings and this this next level of beings have to follow their orders and you know do whatever they are asking them to do at the third level is basically what you have the powers of this dark world um, so that would be cosmo kratos so that word lit cosmo kratos literally means cosmo is you know world kratos is rulers so world rulers so this may be the third level where you know you have the um, different um, sections of the earth being given to different powers and i know they they have authority over the, that particular territory so which is why people talk about territorial spirits and all of that uh, all that is just based upon this one single word, the term that is used over there, Cosmo Kratos. So uh, this seems to be the third level of power. And then, of course, below that, you have the spiritual forces of evil, which are basically your average evil spirits, um, which go about doing the bidding of the higher powers. Now, when, when you come to Colossians 1.16, uh, you again have uh, you know uh, something similar mentioned. Uh, Paul doesn't use the very same terms. He uses certainly di uh, some some different words. But again, he talks about four categories, you know, of uh, of um, um, invisible powers. Where he talks about thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. So maybe in the kingdom of darkness, there are these four hierarchical levels, uh, you know, operating. Uh, so. So that's just that little bit of information that we can extract from these verses. Uh, now coming to the you know um, the fall of the of the angels that chose to rebel, uh, we have some scriptures which talk about that. Uh, so why did the why did some of the angels fall? Uh, why did they rebel? Uh, what was the cause? Uh, we see that um, you know, nicely described actually in uh, Jude one six. Uh, if someone could read out uh, Jude verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Yeah, you know, it talks about how there are some angels who did not keep their positions of authority. They abandoned their proper dwelling. They were meant to hold a certain position. They were meant to, uh, you know, uh, um, serve God in a particular way, but they did not want to keep their position of authority. They tried to abuse the power given to them. And it is these angels upon which judgment has come. It talks about these angels being tied up somewhere in a, in a dark place and being held in bondage over there. So obviously, these particular angels are not you know, freely moving around on the earth doing whatever they wish. Uh, so uh, it looks like as if some angels have been left for a while. Um, you know, to operate as they wish, but while others have already been kept in bondage and they are not, you know, wandering around the earth um, as they wish according to their free will. Uh, so um, we probably would need to look more into detail regarding these things after the break. Uh, so right now, you know, we'll, we'll go to, for our break and at uh, 10, you know, if we could all log back in. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> 